Hi, my name is Dan Paulson. Welcome to my channel, Just One Truth. Just One Truth is about the idea that in this cosmos, there is one truth, no matter what religions, no matter what spiritual philosophies, no matter what you can think of in life, there is one way that everything works, regardless of how we might perceive it. At any rate, that is my interest to get to the bottom of that. This is not okay for some people. Ultimately, what you're going to find here is that I am looking for a scientific explanation for the spiritual things that we see happening, that there is no supernatural, that everything in this universe falls under the, the laws of the universe, the, the physical laws of the universe, that nothing violates that. Um, that, that. That would just be magic. You have to claim magic and you can't show it. You can't demonstrate it. All you can do is talk about it. I don't want to go there. Um, boy, the world is already there. You can find that anywhere. I, I can't do that. I, I find it to be almost, for myself personally, intellectually dishonest. At any rate, I didn't know how to proceed in the next video. Um, but I got a question from Joanna Bentley. And Joanna, thank you for that question. There's two of them, actually. I want to I wanna make this video about that. I feel like I discovered a cave with a big pile of everything that humanity needs. And I, I want people to come and look. That's what I'm trying to do here. And I don't know how to proceed. I was going to do something on the Tao next. Having an interaction like this and having a question asked actually helps focus me on, on something. So I'll just move right into reading the question and we'll get underway. I'm genuinely interested why you feel our spiritual life ends upon death. It is a sticking point, or fear, for me, but I wonder what would be the point of spiritual teachings if there wasn't a bigger purpose or plan. And then there was another question, am I right in thinking that teachings on reincarnation were actually removed from the Bible? Okay, let's start with the first one. I am genuinely interested why you feel our spiritual life ends upon death. Okay, and I've told these stories in in my other videos, but in order to make sure that everything can stay um, complete in this one video, I'm going to have to back up a little bit. Apologies to everybody who is already knows all of this stuff. But for this video, I have to, I have to qualify myself. I was born in uh, a pretty abusive home. My, my brother and I, there was two of us from my mom's first marriage. We were burned with cigarettes and cut with knives by my biological father as he was a, a drunk and coming home and taking money from my mom's tip money or whatever she could make trying to trying to make ends meet and uh th that's how life started off but they divorced but there were still demons elsewhere um it was pretty routine for us to be laying across the bed or out in the yard with a belt just wailing and wailing and wailing as somebody lost it this wasn't a correction i'm going to swat you for doing something wrong this is somebody snapped and a demon is playing out and while they're stern and playing it out, they're just whipping and whipping and whipping and telling you, shut up or you're going to get more. And this was pretty common. It was our life. And one day, Larry learned about heaven in Sunday school. He was 11 years old. And um, I found him that day in the woods. He had uh, hung himself because he wanted to get out and go to heaven. Um, yeah, I was his nine-year-old little brother. I ran home and got a knife and cut him down and I... I, uh, just before I actually went out and found him in the woods, thoughts occurred to me. A thought occurred to me that said, Larry's dead. It's as if somehow something in my mind told me what I was about to, to find. I dismissed it, but there's a combination of things that all happened there that I, I want you to know that I'm approaching this from somebody that wanted an answer. I was in very dire straits and I, I approached this very seriously. And I can assure you, I want to find Larry. Okay, now let's go someplace different. Let's go back early in time. I want to understand the mechanics of Larry's dead. Where did this, where did this thought come into my mind? What brought it to me? I was a kid and I asked in church, oh, it's God warning you or it's angels or something somehow trying to warn you. And you think, well, that's a little after the fact, isn't it? We've been praying for years for help and nobody's doing anything to help us. Why would, you know, that was, that didn't make any sense. The idea that, uh, that that was, that it was God, but I knew it happened. I knew it was real. 
I just didn't believe it was God or angels or whatever. That was my environment. If I had been raised somewhere else, I would have been told something different. Just one truth is to find out what is behind all of those. Okay, in this next part, what I'm going to do is describe what I believe is the scientific mechanism of this magical spiritual world that we often sense, that we feel, that we interact with sometimes, that sometimes provides us with things that you wonder, how did that happen? That was magic. Or just times you read your spouse's mind or the kind of experiences that we have, the, the times that we share feelings. I would theorize it this way, and I'll, let's be clear, it is a theory. We all already know that the universe is massive, this huge, incredible place full of energy everywhere. It is completely full of energy. All the voids that we see, all the empty spaces, energy. Energy is everywhere. In all of this massive amount of universe, as we bring it in, there's one little tiny little... <laughs> part of the universe that actually is developing into physical matter, the carbon and all of the other elements, the, the water, the salt, the things that make up us carbon, all of those, all of that solid stuff is an incredibly tiny amount of what is actually in the universe. And we exist as a, a tiny speck within that in, in some very obscure place. So there's not very much of what we can interact with. The other stuff is there. We can look at it with instrumentation. We can sense it. We, we can interact with some energy without seeing it. But basically in our world, we have five senses and that's how we interact with the world. Except for one more thing. What is this sixth sense and why is it so obscure? This is why. Again, theory. Millions of years ago, we're in a group. We're trying to survive. I'm sure that if we considered ourselves being there, we would find that there's alpha males, alpha females. There are different people performing different roles. And this is something that becomes more evident as we begin to work together. We see primates already doing this, sharing meals and things like that as they go, you know, chimpanzees go kill a monkey and rip it apart limb by limb and they'll pass out pieces. Yeah, that's where, that's where we live. We, that's, that's our place right there. God make that? Anyway, so within all of that, we are eating creatures and creatures are eating us. We're a big group, easy target. The more you can survive, the bigger you get, the better chances you have of surviving. At some point, the group is getting larger and people are diversifying. Not everybody is going to be an alpha male. Not everybody is going to be a worker. Not everybody is going to be, we have different personalities. Today, we still have different personalities. We see them in engineers. We see them in librarians. We see different people that are somehow mentally optimized for different roles. Unfortunately, there's so many of us that not many people find their optimized role. But what seems to me that would have happened is the same thing that's happening today, that the people that are like us, that are the introverts, the sensors, the feelers can't tolerate that crowd. You've got to move to the outskirts. You, you move away. You need a little more space for whatever reason. And maybe that happened that way, or maybe there was a different reason. Who knows? But what we see is that a smaller group of people are very sensitive to the surroundings and, and are on the outskirts. They can't stand it in the middle. What is that? That's your first line of defense. <laughs> this, helps the, this helps the group as, as a society, as an organism, stay healthier by having people on the outside that, that have somehow more sensitivity. You, you, you can sense that lion sneaking up on you. you. You don't see it, but you kind of figure it out. And when you sense it, you're sensing it through what? I am believing that we can see energy within a certain spectrum. We can hear energy within a certain spectrum. We can interact with our physical world. But our brain is more than that. Our brain stretches out, and I believe that there is one more partial connection that we have with each other into the universe, and that is something that doesn't require a physical sense, only a mental sense, and that is our capacity to mildly sense each other's emotional states or to, or to sense fear of somebody uh, 
or joy or anything like that. If somebody's sensing that, if the group senses that, the group is healthier because the group knows to be afraid or it knows to go after whatever it is, uh, fruit, fresh water, something, pile of grubs. Who knows? It would have been an important thing, though, that you could look at and say, that kind of looks like it still happens in the animal world today. And it looks like it's happening in the human world today. And then it's not everybody that some people are better at it than others, that everybody can experience it. Imagine you're the one out there and you see that lion and it's coming down on you and you have that <laughs> visceral <laughs> fear that just, you're going to get eaten. That radiates out and the group that can pick up, the people in the group that can pick up on that and they may not know what's going on. They just sense, oh God, there's a fear somewhere. And I would say that that's probably what is happening. It just looks a whole lot more. And some people are better at it than others because of brain types. Um, I think that's it. It's pretty simple. But you know what? It comes into our head, not from one of our senses. It comes from a magical, mystical place. It's probably coming from our neighbor. We're in a local field. We're all sharing these thoughts. But since we can't see them, smell them, taste them, touch them, we think it's somewhere oh, far away. This is not in our world. Yeah, it is. It's right next door. It's just coming into your brain without going through one of your physical senses. It's coming through uh, a mental sense. And it's meant, to, it's meant to share emotions because that's what we do. We still do that. We can individually experience that. Somebody you're in love with and that, that intensity really grows or experiences with uh, people worshiping or games or... You know, your team is winning, excitement, teaching, learning, getting excited about things. We all experience that sensation. A Christian will say, ooh, there's proof of the Holy Spirit. Or someone else might say there is proof of interaction with Allah or a variety of things. And they are all feeling those things. They believe what it is. But they experience it and they will tell each other that they're the only ones that experience it. Where if you're the one that kind of roams around the world and takes it all in, you go, yeah, they're all experiencing the same thing. <laughs> they don't know that, but they are. And uh, yeah, just one truth. Well, that's it. What are you experiencing? What is your God, your spirit, your energy, all those things that are happening is somehow in that emotional area or that emotional channel, the brain part. It seems as though we have a consciousness, a subconscious, and then uh, uh, there, there almost seems like there's another part that we connect with where you get more knowledge, more information. Um, Hindus call it the Akashic Records. Jesus says, seek and you will find, knock and it will be open. If you're looking for answers, there's somehow things that come to you if you're on this search. You'll find things. And even if you're not on the search and you're looking for something you'll find it. <laughs> I made that point in another video. If you think the earth is flat and you go look for proof, you'll find proof. You will have to deny a lot of things that get in the way. Just like religion, you will have to deny a lot of reality in order to be right. I don't like doing any of that. So th that's where, that's where I look at trying to explain what happened. And Larry's dead. That wasn't just an emotional thing, was it? No. But between the time we developed that, um, that characteristic or just had it naturally to begin with because we're in the universe and we're parts of the universe. We don't violate anything that happens in the universe. So to me, for in that experience for me, the easiest answer then for me is that at some point, Larry stepped off that stump and before he lost consciousness, he was experiencing extreme pain. Imagine that rope smaller, half the diameter of my pinky finger. Imagine that. You would be crying out. You'd be calling out if you changed your mind. He did it in a place where there were no branches or anything around. Uh, it was a committed act. I'm sure he called out to me at some point mentally. And there was nothing I could do. I was busy doing something. I was, I didn't pick up on any of that. When my mind was empty, I picked up on that. And we've now, since we've developed communication, my mind can do more than just sense that something is ominously wrong. But now we can detail it and say, Larry's dead. Of course, I didn't, f I felt it emotionally. Actually, there was an instant where I stopped dead in my tracks, where it was like, and then I, 
the, the thought came to me then, Larry's dead, and I felt it. But then I shook it off and dismissed it and said, that's crazy. So even though I did pick up on what was uh, I was going to experience, uh, I, I nevertheless dismissed it as a crazy thought. And it ended up being real. But I don't think that there were any spirits going around. I think that all the all the mechanisms to make that happen were in place right there. And I think that those mechanisms are there at other times. There's a story I remember reading one time. Um, it was a it was a lady. Uh, it was during World War II, and a woman had a dream that her son, who was in uh, the military over in Germany, had visited her one night and said, Mom, I'm in a better place. Everything is okay. And then about two weeks later, this is, you know, pre-phone calls back and forth and things like that. They didn't notify uh, next of kin uh, without visiting them. She saw a government vehicle park up front and a couple uh, men come out and to come walking, to come up to the house. And she said she already knew what they were going to come and tell her. And sure enough, they said, your son had got killed about two weeks ago over in, in, in war. I, I don't, I, I can see that these things would happen without there being mystical, magical things. The memory of him is in her mind. She has all the component parts there to visualize him. We can, we can see anywhere in the world in our dreams. They've been visceral. <laughs> And you know what? I want to be careful and say that I realize that what I'm saying here, that, that these are anecdotal stories. Uh, there's no way to prove them. I, I told you my story, and I, I'll tell you that that's, that was my experience. I don't need anybody to believe that. I don't need to sell that story. I don't need to. That, that was something that drove me, and that's, all I'm, that's the only reason I'm telling this story. Um, not, not everybody has stories like that. Uh, but there are people who do. It isn't common. Not everybody gets heads up like that. And what did it do for me? It didn't do anything. Somebody told me once it's clairvoyance. And I was like, no, no, it wasn't. It might have looked like clairvoyance that I was about to find Larry, but the reality of it is, is that everything was already done. He was already gone. It was finished. I was now, like after the fact, picking up on something that was already finished. That's how I see it. Okay, Joanna, I haven't started answering your question yet, have I? Why you feel spiritual life ends upon death? I, uh, I still want that answer. I think that as I look and as I experience things, for example, do we have a soul? Uh, there is anecdotal evidence only of a soul. And... You know, when people have like near-death experiences, for example, and they pile up all these near-death experiences. And one thing you notice, that I notice at least, is that everybody's near-death experience is different. There might be a couple of common things, but why not? Everybody in our culture knows what those things are anyway. Nobody's coming in blind, coming back with an experience that, no, that they've never heard anything before. They don't know what to expect. They don't have a belief. And they come back and say, oh, there was this guy in robes and long hair who's called himself Jesus sitting there, said he's waiting. And, you know, if this happens a bunch of times, you can say, okay, I, I can maybe put some validity to that, provided people haven't talked to each other. <laughs> but everybody comes back with a different story. Um, I, I think what they're seeing is whatever is up in their mind, that they're not seeing something beyond here. Why wouldn't we all see it? there's something else I need to let you know that as I do this and as I approach this is that I do not look at anybody that has ever been on this planet as being anything more than a human being that there are not off-world people or that there were not special people here one time that had capabilities that we don't get to have they're special we have to look up to them we have to worship them or follow them yeah that's crap that is crap Everybody on this planet is born with the same potential here. We have different brain types. There are different things we have to work with. But by and large, it's on us. When we hand it off to something outside of us, I think we're failing to take responsibility for what's going on by thinking something else is out there that is somehow acting on our behalf. And if it is, it sure is uh, looking like just nature. <laughs> pretty capricious we're hurting on this planet 
as a, as a species, that many people are fine. But many are not. Anyway, okay. I look at my own life and I know where my awareness began. I don't have to think about it. I don't remember any past lives. I don't remember anything from anywhere, anywhere in the world except for here on planet Earth. As I developed, as I got old enough and my brain developed enough neural networks for me to start understanding uh, that that is a color, that is yellow. And it's also a banana. I can also eat it. These are, these are very simple things that we don't even have when we start. But as we grow and as we develop, as we learn, our life becomes more and more complex. And what do we become? Take a look at yourself and take a look at your friends and take a look at people you wish you were like or wish you had their life instead of yours. We all become products of our environment. With some, yeah, we've got brain type. There's a few different things in there that might dictate some variations. But by and large, the way we process our life, the way we experience it, the way we store it, the way we're convinced of it is what makes us who and what we are. And knowing that you were raised one place and you became one thing, that if you can pull yourself out of that and realize, if I emptied out everything in my head and I went somewhere else and was raised there, I would be a completely different person. I... I don't see that as a soul. I see that clearly as an emergent property of life experiences and cranial development. Why would the soul still be here if the brain goes away? Uh, is it possible that we evolve beyond here? Maybe. There might be something. I don't know. I don't go with this with a conviction. Here's a problem that I have with, with convictions. This is why... <laughs> You shouldn't seek with convictions. If you're a Christian and you're looking for answers, this property is, that we have is going to work. The feelings, the experiences, um, and you looking for answers specifically, you're going to find the answers that fit with what you're looking for. You are going to confirm your religion if you go into this already with a religious belief. So as people are looking for answers in life and they already have a conviction about something, they're going to prove their conviction, but along the way, they're also going to have to dismiss things. You know, as, as, as we move into more modern times and we develop and we continue to learn more and more and we learn about DNA and we learn about evolution and things like that, when people just say, ooh, those don't square with my belief, those are lies. Um, yeah, that's not seeking. That's not seeking and knocking at all. <laughs> that's a, uh, you got to go with an open mind. So I approach everything without a conviction. I don't, um, un un unless it's something that I can see or that we can all see, that we all agree upon. Um, I have a conviction that when I look at the sky, it looks the color of blue, but we all agree upon that. As far as gods and goddesses and different things, the only thing I agree with everybody else on is that whatever your sensations are, yep, those are right. Okay, uh, I'm not sure if I unpacked enough there to answer the question. I'm genuinely interested why you feel our spiritual life ends upon death. Well, I don't know that I would see a reason for it to go on. What else in the universe works like that? We want it to. We got some pretty complex brains. We want to survive. That's why we're here. That's built in. That is intense. We want to survive. So, why wouldn't we want to survive death? Why wouldn't we want an afterlife? But then what happens after that? Um, I want to take a moment here and say something that um, I, I'm okay with people believing in God. I'm okay with people bringing different things to the table, depending on how it's done. I'm open to ideas, but I won't go backwards. If somebody's trying to tell me God exist, supernatural, this, just get on your knees and pray. Ah, goodbye. Have a nice life. If you're somebody though, that's like, oh my God, maybe there's a God, but what does God want? What does God want from us? It's not worship. It's not get on my knees. It's love. It's kindness. It's something different. Okay, let's talk. Um, what is the teaching? I want to know what that is. The life after death part. I don't see that at layer three as I'm interpreting things. 
I see that at layer two. And I see that as being a candy shell to the teaching. I see many times where I would want it to be in place. You got billions of human beings, many with disparaging lives. Who would want people with disparaging lives to live 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years in anguish and hurt? God, we don't even like our little bit, and it gets big. I think if someone's religious belief was a way to help them live life with the idea that that's okay, there's something ahead, whether there is or isn't, but it gives them happiness now or it gives them something that they can hold on to that, that keeps them floating more. Um, I don't know how to put it. I'm okay with that. I want them to have that. It, it's not for me to have, <laughs> but it's for other people to have. And uh, I wouldn't want that to go away. The, the problem with Christianity, I was going to say religion, but that's not true. The problem with Christianity is where that Roman uh, comment from Paul came in about just pretty much just worship Jesus. You accept him as your Lord and Savior and to accept him into your heart. He was born to a virgin, raised, you know, to all that stuff. And bingo, you're a Christian. Follow the Ten Commandments. The 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 religion became so loose that people just turned it into them. That's why there's thousands and thousands of different interpretations of, of uh, the Bible. It's because of that Paul comment in there. That's, that's where men, many Christians say, I'm, I'm good. I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. Now I'm going to go act how I act. And they can act in very evil, hurtful ways. And they do so thinking that they are doing it in the name of God. That's when I want that religion to be gone. But that same religion might bring peace to the heart of a child about ready to pass along, thinking that uh, Jesus is there waiting for them and it brings a smile to their face. You know, it's a two-edged sword. But, but humans... not very well evolved, still acting tribal, still acting like there's not enough resources to go around. We need to kill the black people or the brown people or the yellow people or the whatever people, the liberal people, the conservative. We need to go kill somebody. Yeah, this is tribal. While there's resources, we need to understand what we're doing and where we came from. We can't change our behavior if we continue to think that we're acting out somehow in line with the God. That's where I start having a difficult time. When you realize that there are people who think life starts after you die anyway. What does it matter? It opens up opportunities for people to be incredibly hateful, very cavalier, and dismiss the hurt, the pain, death of other people thinking it's no big deal. This isn't the real one anyway. I got a problem with that. Yeah, I sure do. I don't want people thinking there's an afterlife if, if that means then your current life doesn't matter. So I don't know what to do about it. You look at it and, and go, God, that's so ensconced into billions of people. Nobody going to pick that out. It has to emerge out slowly. Um, but education needs to be there. And a lot of people that are very ensconced in their religion actually shun education or education that reaches beyond their comfort level. I think probably one of the biggest benefits we could give to our children and future generations is to stop telling them what to believe in and tell them there's magic out there. Go find out. Go find out what makes it work. Go find out for yourself. If we want our children to do better than us, um, we teach them how to think. Don't tell them what to think. Let them learn. Let them explore. Let them grow. Don't limit them with programs. Don't make them into something that you are. Let them grow into something that they can be. Let them become bigger. Do I think that there's a life after death? I don't know. 
Do I wish there was one? I wish... I wish I could see Larry. Although I... More than seeing him, I wish... Uh, I wish he could have lived without having experienced that pain. And I'm at a point in life where... I reconcile his death by... Um, letting... Letting his story help other people. Yeah, and that's just happenstance. That's uh, just the luck of the draw. Here we are. I don't know what else to say or do. I'm not going to say there's a God or not a God or a life or an afterlife or not. Or I don't, I don't want to have those fights and arguments with people. Uh, I, I want to be more encompassing and open, but I'm not going to be open to layer two or layer one of teachings. There's a nested teaching. I'm going to be open to the nested teaching. The theist and the atheist that want to fight over the reality of some miracle, that's for them. I want to know what I do for me. That's I'm, I'm getting something else out of this. This is a personal teaching, not a wait till you die, life is going to be okay teaching. And I think that if I approached my entire seeking, thinking that there was a God or an afterlife or something like that, that I would have limited my capacity to find what's there because I would have been focused on trying to prove what I believed. So it's important for me to not have those beliefs. It's okay if, if you guys want to join in and help in and, and you have different beliefs, but please allow me to have my beliefs because I can, I can come up with different things by not having a conviction that I have to stay within the framework of. If that makes sense. Okay. I'm going to go back to the question. I'm genuinely interested why you feel our spiritual life ends upon death. We covered that. It is a sticking point or fear for me. But I wonder what would be the point of spiritual teachings if there wasn't a bigger purpose or plan. What I see in the spiritual teachings at layer three is a, is a way to live life now. It's a way to heal now, not to wait till after you die, but to do it while you're alive, knowing that not very many people will do that. More people will be happy living life thinking it'll be okay later. That's ah, humans. That's not our lot, though, for some of us. You watching this, we got a different thing and it's going to hurt uh, we won't have that kind of comfort that they have because we have to go through the anguish of resolving things that we can't just say, I turn it over to a higher power. We don't have that, <laughs> which is good. That's a blessing, the blessing from hell, but it's a good blessing <laughs> because it doesn't feel good, but it shows you, it teaches you, it brings you to an understanding that relinquishing doesn't bring you to. Is there a bigger purpose plan? Yeah, uh, live life now. That might suck to hear. And if you don't like it, that's okay. Uh, that's okay. I know. I know. I've certainly not liked it. I get it. Um, what's the plan of the, the, the teachings are for us to heal. That's this right here. And the, the magic and supernatural vehicle. Those are shells. Those are carrier shells. And we have an example of that. Moses talked about it, carrying a golden box. All the people carry it, but they can't see inside. <laughs> Only a few people can see inside. Yeah. Um, Jesus said the same thing. Many are standing outside the narrow gate, but only the solitary will enter in. What's solitary? You've started out two and you're trying to become one. It's not a magical, mystical place, although we... We've been taught that so much, it's difficult to separate that thinking out of what's going on here. Take Jesus' teachings out of the Bible. Take them out of the New Testament. Read it as a Dhammapada or a Tao Te Ching, not as a, a Roman religion. Okay, um, finally... The last part was, am I right in thinking the teachings on reincarnation were actually removed from the Bible? 
I'm not a scholar. I, I would say no on that, but I'll tell you also I'm not a scholar, and I don't approach any of this ever as a scholar. Um, I think what will become evident here is that I've got something different going on, that it's not something from academia, and uh, it's not layer two. It's like, ooh, there's something different in here, and we have to look at it in a different way. It's almost a language thing, and it's it's really just learning what they're using as analogs for their nested teachings, and, and then we find everything. Speaking of analogs for nested teachings, the reincarnation. Uh, what is reincarnation on the outset is this idea that you are born and you have a life. And during that lifetime, you try to get rid of all of the karmic baggage that you have in order to ascend and be beyond. And that if you can't get rid of it in this lifetime, don't worry, you will be reborn and you get another shot at it. And you continue to work at it until you've cleaned out everything from your your spirit, your soul. Your karma has been erased, or the bad karma. There's good karma, too. Okay, well, we know all of that. I, I That's supernatural, number one. Number two, this is where we teach our kids to, <laughs> to think. Uh, tell them to start asking questions. Uh, the population is growing. Where are the extra souls coming from? How about when dinosaurs walk the earth? Where were human souls then? Or are we the descendants of uh, dinosaur souls? 13.8 billion years ago when the universe was first being formed and there wasn't solid matter yet, where were the souls? Where did they come from? At some point you go, yeah, this falls apart as fast as anything else. It doesn't stand up. Layer three, what do we got? Remember Jacob's Ladder? Uh, what is the spiritual path? We are looking to heal ourselves from our hurt. We got hurt in life, this life, not last life, this life. We've been molested. We've been raped. We've been beat. We've been burned. We've been all kinds of things. And we're looking for a way to find peace. And as you get to a point where you realize I've got to start doing some forgiving and this is tough stuff. I got to forgive somebody who hurt me that hurt me so bad, so long that it's really ensconced in my personality. It's difficult. I have to do that. And once you complete that, you feel wonderful. You feel great. Once you've gotten rid of something, once you've healed something, but there's going to be something else. You, you just got the worst layer or one layer, and now you're going to have to keep at it maybe a week or two or three or a month or a year or years. If you want to continue on this path, you got to go clean out the next thing, clean out the next thing, your perceptions, your experiences, your pain, your hurt, your shame. All of those things have to be taken out. And each one of those is a step along the way towards ascension. So Jacob's ladder, what do we see? He's got his head on his head on a stone representing being of the earth, but the ladder ascends going up into the heavens. So we, there's this steps. It's not one shot. It's steps. What is reincarnation? Same story, different analog. Uh, a rebirth happens every time you resolve a pain or a, or a shame or a hurt. And then when that's done, you get another one. That reincarnation isn't life after life after life. It's one life, experience after experience after experience. Then it makes sense to me. Uh, again, this is theory. There are people, <laughs> I, I've had Hindus as angry at me as, as Christians can get, <laughs> telling me how stupid I am. <laughs> I get that. Uh, I don't see it that way. I see a validity in the story as a healing process now in life, not as something that I should eh, just hang on and wait. You're going you're gonna to come back and get another shot at it. I don't remember my last shot and everything that screwed up my life. I got no questions where it came from. It didn't come from me being some idiot thousands of years ago. It came from this life. It came from this experience. No, I don't think anything about reincarnation was removed from the Bible, but I believe that the Bible teaches you to take steps to continue. Uh, Jesus says, if you go one mile to take care of, uh, to help 
we have to decode that. There's a, there's an idea though, that you're, you're helping something that needs, you're helping a person that needs help. When we decode the spiritual teachings, it's about us. So we are actually consciously going after something subconsciously inside of us that is hurt. You have to go do what it takes to heal that and then be ready to take another step. I think these are all common teachings throughout all of them, uh, through all of the world religions and that they're just nested in different ways and that the, that the, that those are carrier shells. And that means at the end of the day that I've just like, what made the afterlife go away, made God go away, all of that. I don't know what there is. I don't know what there is beyond here. I don't know if we are on an evolutionary course. You know, I can get as crazy as anybody and say, hmm, what are these UFOs coming around? Maybe there's interdimensional beings that are observing us and only certain people evolve from the physical world into their spiritual world. And, you know, what does it take to get there? And it doesn't take worship or anything like that. If they, maybe they wrote the stuff and they put clues out there and they're trying to help us. And really the truth is, is trying to just find a way to heal yourself. The people that move on are the people that know how to help and care for others without being in fear without spiritual fear they're just good people you know would god if i was god would i want to see thousands millions of people out there prostrating themselves praising me <laughs> hell no <laughs> i'd i'd want to i'd want to goof around with them or something i would want to know that if if some people over there needed help that 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 they would get help, that there are good people, that they're just good people. Um, I don't, I don't like the idea of worshiping God and then doing his bidding. Religion becomes, religion morphs, it evolves and it becomes the face of the current day's ruling political elite and power, whether, whether that's in Saudi Arabia or Texas. Um, the religions change with people. And that's why it's so dangerous to believe in a religion and then go on a search. You're just creating it in your image. You got to let everything go and go see what's there without convictions. Anyway, no. Uh, I think I've said things that are probably disheartening the people. And I know they are, they've been disheartening to me, but I'm trying to just, I guess, analytically process what I see, what I've learned and how I understand it and pass it along in a way that hopefully is meaningful to somebody and helpful to them as well. Anyway, Joanna, thank you again for the question. I'm glad that it, uh, I'm glad you asked that. And I hope, I hope the answer is okay. The forgiveness is the tough part. I know we've talked about some things. Remember this. Things happen. Everybody has things happen and we process it and say it's a good thing or it's a bad thing. And that's how we put it away. It's that moment of decision on what it is that is the real mechanism of what continues to hurt us. It is the way we have that pain stored. And we have to go and look at the pain and figure out a way around it and understand the chain and blah, blah, blah. It's, uh, it's, it's not easy. I mean, it's, it's mechanical. It is actually simple. It is simple, <laughs> but it isn't easy because it is emotionally difficult. It hurts. It's easy to do. I mean, it's easy to poke a finger in your eye, but it would hurt. That's kind of what you're doing. <laughs> it is. It's our mind's eye. We're going to clear it out without changing our water source to clear the, <laughs> the calcification on our pineal gland. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, Western Enlightenment. Um, no, we got to go in and do real work. And it, uh, anyway, well, I went off subject there, didn't I? Everyone, thanks uh, for your time and um, love one another. We'll see you in the next video.